listeners, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you today? Oh, pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. This is a much better weather for you to drive over here today. <laughs> yeah, at least it wasn't raining. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, dude, it's hot, man. It's like 98 degrees, dude, but... it is so hot outside. Yeah. Uh, the the poor the air conditioner just can't do it like in my house in my car like it's just it works but it don't work that good yeah, well I got mine set at seventy one and it is not running right now which means yeah, it was it nice when up. we when when I walked in I was like of course any air conditioning feels nice when you walk in from ninety eight degrees yeah yeah exactly <laughs> I um. Somebody said to me, was talking to me just recently about, well, you know, at least we're down here on the coast and like you get that nice cool breeze. I was like, that breeze is not cool. What no, are you talking no, no. about? Yeah. That breeze feels like somebody just turned a dryer on. I'm telling you, like <laughs> South Alabama hot's a different breed. Yeah. It, it just, it well, is. Well, I think just coastal hot, Gulf Coast hot. Yeah. That's generally. probably what it is. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. Anytime you're close to the water and the heat and like yeah. that yeah. moisture coming up because it's, because it's the humidity that kills you. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so I saw a friend of mine the other night I hadn't seen in a long time. Um, he's a military guy, and uh, he's working remotely right now. So he's here at home working with some some group in Kuwait, I guess. Yeah. And uh, he said, but he spent some time over there. Yeah. And he's like, man, it's just unreal hot. And I was like, well, but it's desert though, right? Like it gets cool at night. Yeah. And he he said, no, not, I mean, Kuwait City, it's right there on the Gulf. And okay. so, no, no. it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, because uh, when I think of desert heat, that's what I think of. Like <laughs> super hot during the day, but then like cold at night. Yeah. You know. When I was out in Arizona, uh, it, yeah, that's what it was like. And it was the, it was like living on Mars, I thought. I, yeah. Because I, I couldn't, I could not get used to. Uh, yeah, I could not get used to the temperature changes in the spring where it would you would wake up, it would be 28 degrees and there'd be snow on the ground. Yeah. And by 10 o'clock, it was 80 degrees and the snow was all gone. Yeah, right. And by like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it was 110. Wow. <laughs> and then when the sun went down, it went right back down below freezing again. It's just like, <laughs> how, do you, how do you people live that, like this? That's the type of weather that makes you sick. Yeah, like because that that affects your allergies and all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. Your body just doesn't know how to react to these constant changes. You yeah. Know? Well, and the air was so dry, and uh, so it's like I couldn't touch my nose. Like, yeah. All the little hairs in your nose get stiff. Uh huh. And so it's like you have a bunch of needles poking in oh, <laughs> all man. the time. Oh, uh, that was that was bad. My hair was long at the time, and uh, here I could just keep it in a ponytail, no problem. Yeah. Out there. Like it was so straight because it was so dry yeah. that just walking it would slip out of a ponytail. Oh, you couldn't I, even keep it the ponytail. Yeah, I had to wear like a baseball cap and like pull it through. Oh wow! The back, which is not a great look. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was gonna say. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not really a cap guy anyway. Oh, man. You gotta do the man bun. Just <laughs> bun it up. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, no. Nah, I don't think it would. I don't know. Yeah, it still I, probably I, wouldn't I, stay, yeah. I've never had hair that long, so I don't know how to... I don't know how to do that, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah. I never had before, and yeah. I, I didn't learn while I was out there. I wasn't out there long enough for that. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was like living on some alien planet. I just didn't, I didn't yeah. get it. Didn't care for it. No, no. I don't... Yeah, I don't think I'd go back there. Yeah. Gonna but, stay here on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, in other news, I only have one episode left of Firefly, so my quarterly viewing ah. of Firefly is, <laughs> will probably be over tonight. Oh, nice. That's too bad. i got to figure out what to do next. No. I think I think I'm going back to Arcane. Oh, yeah? I really like that series. That was a I'll good show. I mean, I enjoyed it. Have you heard anything about the newest season? Is it coming out? or No, I don't know. Surely they're doing another season. I would hope so. I mean, I, I figure they uh, Although to. I'm a little scared. <laughs> yeah. Like, the first season was so good, and they're... The bar is yeah. high, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm terrified that a second season is going to completely ruin the show, but maybe not. We'll see. As long as they keep the writers, that's that's what you have to worry about. Mm-hmm. Alternatives are like uh, Dollhouse or something. That's all. I this is totally with. irrelevant. I don't know why I'm talking about this. <laughs> I, I'm not talking about TV shows instead of whiskey, even. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm hoping that maybe we finish off this bottle of Booker's tonight, so I can clear some space in my cabinet. Yeah, well, that's going to be up to you because I poured all the bookers I'm going to have tonight. Uh, it's good. I like it, but I got to drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excuses, uh, excuses. Always. <laughs> Always. 
Um, so, so what's going on in the world, Mike? You tell me. I don't know, man. So it, it sounded a whole lot like earlier this week we were going to have a civil war in Russia. Oh yeah, um, the civil war in Russia. Like that was like that was like the news for like one day. Aren't they still talking about that? I mean, it's still out there, but it's not like it. They, they've pumped the brakes a little bit on that. Well, yeah. So Yevgeny Prigozhin um, took a, some of his troops. Yeah, they're only kind of barely his troops, actually, but um, and turned to march on Moscow. Yeah, and and then he stopped. <laughs> so so did he like negotiate with Putin to stop, or how exactly did the stop work? Because all of this has been kind of fuzzy in the mainstream media. I had a real hard mm-hmm. time gathering exactly what was happening. Well, the story. Uh, how far back do you want me to start? All right. Well, let's, let's From the start beginning. It. No, before the beginning. <laughs> All right. Before the beginning, um, this is actually a state group. Okay. Like it was formed by the the Russian state. Not. It's not like it. So it's not a mil- or a. Um, it's not an independent militia. Okay. Right? Yeah. Exactly. But he's in control of it. Okay. And so he gets these these fat military contracts for taking this group wherever, yeah. um, and uh, and that's probably where it starts. So. The Russian Defense Ministry um, said that they wanted all independent fighters to sci- sign contracts with the Russian, the, ar- the with army. With the state. Yeah, with the state army. Yeah. Um, and uh, Prigozhin didn't like this because it will cost him money. Well, I mean, they're in, they his, become, in his mind, those are his men. Yeah, probably. I mean, that would uh, be my guess. And so that's, that's really where it started. Is that he? Um, he's looking at this as a. Uh, I mean, it's something like a two billion dollar contract or something like that. Yeah, it may not be that much. Maybe it's two million. I get. I, I get my my mo's and my buzz <laughs> confused sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of money anyway. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and he's going to be out that money, um, or at least some significant portion of it, if they signed contracts with the the um, Russian army. Besides the fact that he no longer has like direct control that way. Yeah. I mean, he probably still would have direct control, but he could be overruled. But wasn't he having issues with some of the generals in any way? Yeah, he was, um, he was complaining about, uh, that they, that his group wasn't being supplied well. Yeah. And that's been going on for a while. Um, but he's just kind of a big mouth guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> I think that the real issue, though, is this thing about them signing contracts with the Russian military. and That um, was kind of the straw, maybe. Yeah. And so that became the excuse to like pull out and try and prevent that from happening. Yeah. I think. So, but problems arose. Yeah. Um, one of them is he had like 25,000 troops and only like three or 4,000 of them went with him. Yeah. Um, none of his officers, as far as I know, uh, participated in were d- decided to make the turn <laughs> yeah um the idea that this was a coup was fallacious right from the beginning because he made it clear that he had no intention of overthrowing putin yeah um but that he wanted uh i, I guess he wanted like a uh, sergey shoigu um and gerasimov or something like one of these generals and the the um head of the the defense minister and one of these generals to be Fired to move on, yeah. Um, but he wasn't going to get that yeah. either. I, I mean, I, I think that he got just a little too full of himself. That he thought that he had more influence than he than he did. Yeah. Um, and I think that when it became clear that he didn't have as much influence as he thought, he thought better of it too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, you know, Putin handled it really well, also. Um. And it kind of goes against the whole narrative that he's this terrible autocratic dictator that he didn't he didn't execute these guys. So, so what exactly did he do to these guys? Because there hasn't been a lot in the <clears throat> mainstream about like what they what he ended up doing with them. Okay, um, so uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin himself uh, is being essentially exiled to Georgia, and okay. by the way, the way the story comes out is that the negotiation was actually done. Um, by, uh, oh gosh, now his name slips my mind. The, the Georgian president, um, or not Georgian president, the Belarusian president. So he's, he's being exiled to Belarus. 
Okay. Um, gosh. I, is it Lushenko? Lushenko. Yeah. Lukashenko. Lukashenko, yeah. Yeah, Lukashenko. Really bad at pronouncing names, but yeah. I knew that one. So, yeah, no, <laughs> Lukashenko uh, supposedly um, got on the phone with Prigozhin and, and was the mediator yeah. um, or mediator or whatever. Kind of helped him them sort Putin. it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he'll be under, I mean, Lukashenko is, is definitely under, um, Russian control as, as much as anybody. Yeah. Um, so he'll be a good, like open air jailer for Prigozhin. Yeah. I, I think, uh, as far as the, the rest of the Wagner group troops, um, they've been given the option and I think this includes even the people that participated in the in the quote unquote coup that was never a coup. The, yeah. we'll, we'll call it a mutiny. Yeah. Um, even those that participated in the mutiny, I think, were given the option of either um, signing contracts with the Russian army, um, self exiling to Belarus, or uh, going home. Oh wow! Just that's interesting. Yeah. Um, well, now, work, home for some of them is jail, right? Home for some of them is jail. Home <laughs> yeah. for some of them is other countries because there are foreign fighters in the group oh, as okay. well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I don't know. Interesting. I suspect that most of them will probably sign contracts with the Russian army. Yeah. I mean, that's the logical thing for them to do. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is that it. Okay. You know what? Uh, well, no, we'll come to that later. I've got a clip from Blinken after this that just is kind of <laughs> so absurd. But one of the claims that they're making is that it shows the weakness of Putin. Yeah. Um, like Scott Ritter says that it's definitely an embarrassment, but it hardly shows the weakness. And and pretty much everybody well, that really knows what's going on there, like Gilbert Doctorow and and some of these um, academics and uh, you know military people and just people that are familiar with Russian culture and and news in Russia and so forth yeah. um, are saying that it actually shows just the opposite. Yeah. Uh, that it actually shows that Putin's really strong. The fact that a, a bunch of these oligarchs and that type of thing didn't smell blood in the water and make a move mm -hmm. during this kind of, to me at least, that seems to say something because it seems like if Putin truly was weak in his country, yeah. like something like this could have, could have uh, maybe not worked, but became a real problem that yeah. it doesn't seem that has, has happened. Like it doesn't seem like this has became a real problem at all. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, none of the other military officers, uh, got behind this. Yeah. Um, the opposition parties in Russia didn't get behind this. Even the, like, I guess respectable, you would say, um, but outspoken critics of, of Vladimir Putin didn't get behind this. Like nobody got on board. Yeah. Yeah, like and if, Putin, if if Putin was really that weak, I've got to think that some of those groups would have would have pounced on this. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that he didn't have them all executed, that he he's actually yeah. letting everybody get away with it, essentially. Yeah, actually, is a big show of strength, also, because it's like I'm not even concerned. Yeah, yeah, I'm not even I'm not even trying to like destroy my enemies or whatever. You yeah, know? I'm gonna. There's no need. I don't need to. Yeah, exactly. Um. It does illustrate. I, I I was thinking about this. I had to pull this book out because, uh, um, so I pulled out uh, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince because he goes into some. There's a couple of chapters about the types of military units, and he talks about um, mercenaries yeah. to some degree. Now, like I said, these were technically Russian state, so um, yeah. they're not exactly mercenaries, but it's kind of close. But they're close, yeah. And so I, I wanted to read a couple of passages from this. All right. Um, this is chapter 12 of, of The Prince. And let me see if I can find my place again. Um, he says, uh, talking about mercenaries, he says, um, And if a prince holds on to his state by means of mercenary armies, he will never be stable or secure, for they are disunited, ambitious, without discipline, disloyal. They are brave among friends, among enemies they are cowards. They have no fear of God, they keep no faith with men, and your downfall is deferred only so long as the attack is deferred. And in peace you are plundered by them and war your, by your enemies. Uh, the reason for this is that they have no, uh, no other love nor other motive to keep them in the field than a meager wage, which is not enough to make them want to die for you. 
They love being your soldiers when you're not making war, but when the war comes, they either flee or desert. Now, this isn't exactly true. This group, they actually fought really well. Yeah. Um, but it, it does at least, uh, you know, kind of illustrate the danger of, of mercenary groups. Yeah. Um, but then to apply this to Yevgeny Prigozhin specifically, he says, mercenary captains are either excellent soldiers or they are not. If they are, you cannot trust them since they will always aspire to their own greatness, either by oppressing you who are their masters or by oppressing others against your intent. But if the captain is without skill, he usually ruins you. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Definitely an attempt at that almost, <laughs> yeah. to say the least. So I, like, when I heard about this, I kept thinking about like, uh, some of those lines, and I had to go pull them out. Yeah. Um, that'll have to go back to the bookshelf when we're, when we're done here, but. Well, it was it, to, so my big thing here. Well, I had two two thoughts as this kind of was going on. My first was that which didn't really doesn't really seem to have panned out that way. But my first thought when all of this was going on is, oh, okay, so this is a mercenary group, and our State Department has just decided that it's time to end this. So instead of f- f- funneling our money to Ukraine, we're just going to buy these mercenaries and have them in this thing for us. Yeah. Um, that was my first thought. It um, is a possibility. You think so? Um, it is a possibility. I mean, Prigozhin was making it clear publicly that he had some beefs with uh, uh, some upper-level military staff Yeah. in Russia. Yeah. So, I mean, that is the kind of thing that... If we were you know, like doing, the CIA might yeah. pay attention to and try and manipulate. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that it's likely in this case. Yeah. I, I think I, honestly, I think that he's too much of a patriot for that to have worked anyway. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think this is really just about money. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it does seem to have kind of played out that way. The mm-hmm. other thing that I found really interesting from the, for, about this, and the thing that we should all kind of find scary about it, is the way that our politicians here at home reacted to this situation. The yeah. whole, like, oh, it's finally happening, you know, like civil war in Russia. Like, mm-hmm. there really was kind of, especially the first day when all of this was kind of coming out and there was a lot of like real unknowns about it. Yeah. Like just how excited our people got about the prospect that maybe there was going to be a civil war in Russia mm-hmm. and that they're going to unseat Putin. And just people who listen to this podcast know kind of how we stand and what we think about this, but that's a scary thing to think that our people would be that excited about the possibility of there being chaos in a nuclear powered country. Yeah. In in the country with the biggest nuclear stockpile. Yeah. In fact. Exactly. Um yeah, I, I don't understand why they never consider the possibility that it could get worse. Yeah. Uh, and like that the, the, the next guy could be worse. Yeah. I mean and all evidence seems to port point as far as I can see that anybody that was to follow Putin up in this moment, like mm-hmm. right now, within the next handful of years will have to be worse than Putin. Yeah, would be more of a hardliner. More of a hardliner, the West. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we watched it happen in Iran. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we had, a, we had a guy in Iran that was kind of, um, you know, interested in talking with the, the West, and then Trump pulled out of the nuclear deal, and all those hardliners that were against the West were proven right that we couldn't be trusted. Yep. Um, and then the next election, they elected somebody that was not interested in talking with the West. Exactly. Um, I mean, even it, like just look at Our between recent. World War One and World War Two. Yeah. Right. Like uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was replaced by Hitler. Yeah. Um, exactly. The czars were replaced by uh, by Lenin and Stalin. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, history is littered with these instances where mm-hmm. where the person that comes next is worse, you know, yeah. and especially in the situation that we've created here mm-hmm. where it's not like we've been friendly to Russia or the Russian people the past, what, decade? More than it's that. More than a decade. More yeah. than that, but particularly the last decade. Mm-hmm. Um I mean, it just, it, would, it wouldn't make any sense for the Russian population to tolerate anybody that was that was friendly to the west yeah it's just a hubris about um the the i don't know if it's the intelligence agencies or whomever 
yeah. feel like they have so much control that they would be able to place the person that they want in power. Yeah. Like they did in Ukraine. Yeah. But Russia and Ukraine. But no, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I would I would say throughout history, like that's an anomaly. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, it happens. Like I mean, we have enough control. Like smaller countries, we can come in and and put our little puppet in. But it's not. That's not the norm, and especially when you talk about a population the size of Russia. Yeah. Yeah, or a country with that kind of power. That too. yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um. Yeah, and so. I I. Uh, I think that that's the part that nobody seems to be considering that that we like to point out over and over again is that, that like nuclear wars, you know. Okay, so um, Tom Woods has a new free one of his free ebooks. Uh, um, that's uh, your I Facebook, love the titles of these, by the way. <laughs> your face, yeah. Your Facebook friends are wrong. Yep. Um, so it's uh, your Facebook friends are wrong about Ukraine, and in his his yeah. little um, spot for it, he always says. Um, the uh, the idea that uh, of a nuclear war ending all of humanity is not a Russian talking point, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh man! And so, uh, but that's exactly it. Like, who controls those things if we if Putin's gone? Yeah, Putin has actually shown himself over his or career even, to be like very measured and controlled. Oh, absolutely. Like we don't know that the next guy will be, and what what particularly? I think, we, I think we've pointed out that we could be pretty confident that he won't. That he won't be. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the thing that bothered me with this incident the most is that like the prospect here wasn't that Putin was going to be unseated in a week or something. Mm-hmm. The prospect was that there was going to be a civil war. In yeah, Russia. we can watch millions more Russians die. And and to think that. That our people here at home was was relishing that as a, mm-hmm. as a good thing, as a positive, yeah. is just insane to me. Well, it just illustrates again that the whole point of this war and the reason that we won't let Ukraine end it and that we keep pumping weapons and, and money into Ukraine is because the whole goal is just to weaken Russia. Now, we moved that stuff, little man. <laughs> I see. We we learned before the uh, podcast that we have a thief. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, he can get up there now. It doesn't matter. Yeah, what but it, I don't want him to. <laughs> so the the twist ties for some of these cables and so forth that we usually sit on the edge of the table they kept disappearing. And yeah. um, it was a big mystery last week. So I'm just yeah. going to say, after the podcast last week, like my mind was occupied really hard by what happened to all of these twist ties I had. And it, it turns out that one of my cats thinks that they're just phenomenal toys. Yeah. And uh, so he was jumping up on the chair when we weren't paying attention and pulling them off the table. <laughs> Which is pretty amazing that he could pull it off because he totally nailed it last week. Yeah. Well, he nailed it this week too, but I caught him with one of the things uh, later. Yeah. Like he managed to pull it off the table and remove it without us without noticing. Without us noticing, yeah. So oh. anyway. With, Not with, anymore. <laughs> I got my eye on you, thief. Right. <laughs> So, uh, no, I mean, yeah, uh, it, like I say, I, to just to reiterate, it just amazes me that our people could be could be that naive. Like yeah. that's the leadership we have in this country right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think everybody, regardless of how you fall on the Ukraine um, mess, like just take that into account. Like what what would reality really look like if we decided that um, or if Russia had fallen in the civil war? Like what what does that world look like? Yeah, I pulled the chair back out because I'd rather him jump on the chair than the table. Oh, uh, fair enough. <laughs> he looked like he was about to go for the table. I just yeah, just go ahead and let him <laughs> let him get on the chair. Look up there, not find what he's looking for. <laughs> I'm gonna move him back and give him to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, then you'll have to chase him around at the end of the episode. When you're we may have a civil up. war in this house tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, so before we move on, though, like, on that note. Uh, let's play what what Blinken's had to say after this event. Okay. We've seen this aggression against Ukraine become a strategic failure across the board. Russia is weaker economically, militarily. Its standing around the world has plummeted. It's managed to get Europeans off of Russian energy. It's managed to unite uh, and strengthen NATO with, with new members and a stronger alliance. It's managed to uh, alienate from Russia and unite together Ukraine in ways that it's never been before. This is just an added uh, chapter to a very, very bad book that uh, Putin has written for Russia. Okay, so that was like 30 seconds of a bunch of statements. Now, let me 
play you the true bit of that. All right. It's managed to get Europeans off of Russian energy. Yeah, that's the only thing there that is true, is that he did manage to get Europe off of Russian oil. Yeah. They're selling Russian oil just fine to other places. Well, and and even that statement, while true, isn't exactly a positive. Like, <laughs> I mean, I know to a lot of people that's like, oh, well, at least, you know, that's less oil on the market or blah, blah, mm-hmm. or, you know. I mean, I guess there's an argument for climate change or whatever in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, but all it's really done is push Russia closer to China. Yeah. And that's not a good thing. Like that's not I mean you're to me all that does is start drawing the the dividing lines for World War 3. Mm-hmm. Because we're already pushing towards China anyway. So Yeah. I mean not, Well, everything else he said there is, is untrue. Um yeah. the so the Russian economy you may be able to make the case right at this moment that it's worse. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly less trade. Like they're they they don't have the same level of trade that they did before because of all the sanctions and everything. Yeah. Have they lost um, to McDonald's? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and the Russian ruble, like today, is worth less than it was before the war started. Yeah. But that's only been like in the last like less than a month, I think, yeah. um, that that's been true. Uh, for a lot of the time that this war has been going on, the Russian ruble was actually stronger than it was. Yeah, before because the people war. had to start. Our countries had to start buying them if they were going to buy Russian oil. Yeah, <laughs> it created the demand for the currency. Exactly. The statement that their military is weaker—that's absolutely ridiculous. That yeah. military is about three hundred thousand men stronger than it was before the war, and now they've got experience too. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely a stronger <laughs> military than it was before. Yeah. Um. The uh, idea that the Russian standing has dropped throughout the world. No, it's only dropped throughout the Eurocentric West. Yeah. Um, The rest of the world doesn't feel quite the same way about this. Well, and that's what we forget. And I I don't have a list of countries, but there's a lot of countries that are just kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting to see how this plays out. Yeah. Um, the like we make a big game of, you know, we've got all these people behind us and blah, blah, blah. But there's mm-hmm. a lot of people, a lot of I say people, but I mean countries that are just kind of sitting on the sidelines like, yeah, I'm going to stay out of this. And when things shake out, I'll make some decisions. Um, they haven't actually made NATO any stronger. Actually, I think it's kind of exposed some cracks in NATO. Not everybody's oh, on yeah. board with this. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're, you're you're seeing some pushback. I mean, the. U.S. has managed to corral pretty much everybody at this point. Yeah. Um, but especially, you know, six, eight months ago, you were seeing the Germans start to break a little bit. The French start to break a little bit. Yeah. Um, the, the, there aren't actually new members in NATO yet. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> or did Finland, did they actually? Mm, I think Finland joined. I'm pretty sure. I think sure. they offered, well, maybe. I think that I they just offered, uh, like officially offered or whatever, but I don't know that it's been finalized. It may I not could be have wrong been finalized. That. It may, I thought it had been, but it could be wrong. Um, the, but it's okay. in the works. There's a possibility then that that statement is true also. Yeah. Um, Ukraine may be fairly united, but it's got about 60% fewer people than it did before. Yeah. Uh, and the country that's been war trapped, like trashed. Like, yeah. Um, and then, well, I mean, I guess the statement to make about that is that they're more united because all the people that disagreed left. Yeah, yeah. And then the idea that Russia is more divided than it's been is just silly. Yeah. Uh, it's another I mean, one of those points that they're making about how, you know, Putin's weakness is showing, the cracks in the system are showing. No, they're not. No. I mean, and and we know this to be true because at least a lot of us have experienced this through 9-11. Like, mm-hmm. these type of actions like rally the people to the country like yeah. or to the flag or the rally to the flag thing is real. Right. Yeah. So. Rally, rally the flag effect or whatever yeah. they call it. Yeah. And it may be temporary. Like over the span of 10 years, this may get, get tiresome because that's mm-hmm. kind of what happened in the U S after nine 11, you know, mm-hmm. I mean that, but you know, through Bush, the rally to the flag was hard, but by Obama, we were kind of over it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, tired, tired of seeing those crates come home. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Coffins, so, I should say, I guess. Yeah. But still like the point stands. Um, so that's not the only thing that's going on in foreign policy though. I, th- yeah. I think we've beaten that one down pretty yeah, good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I feel, um, so Lindsey Graham and Richard Blumenthal have um, proposed a resolution. Two of Mike's favorite people, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Big fans, Mike is. <laughs> Especially Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham. Oh, yeah, that's, that's his boy right there. <laughs> uh, 
yeah. So they proposed a resolution. Do, you know, sarcasm doesn't come over well on a podcast, <laughs> oh, by yeah. the way. So, I, so, people, so people may believe that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hope not. Yeah. They, they'd have to be first-time listeners. They would right? have to be. Um, have to be. So anyway, they proposed a resolution that says that if that includes a point that if Russia damages or attacks a nuclear power plant and radiation is released that damages a NATO country, that that should trigger Article 5. It's um, an act of uh, war. Yeah. Um, to call everybody to arms to defend that country. So correct me if I'm wrong. If something happens, because the 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 plant in question here is a Zaporizhia. Right. Um, if something actually happened to that, I thought that Russia was the one that was downwind from this plant. Yes, that's also true. <laughs> okay. Um, like, I mean, I, I couldn't remember if I maybe I got that wrong, but... It is in the south, kind of central, kind of, well, I guess more more east than central, but... All right, so we'll say southeast portion of Ukraine. Yeah. And uh, prevailing winds tend to um, travel northeast. So yeah. it would move across all the Russian controlled Ukrainian territories and into Russia. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it may affect like Poland or some place. I mean, yeah. It doesn't all move in the same direction. It does create a. Well, cloud, yeah, there's going to be a cloud, and you know, um, and who knows where the cloud will go, but yeah. you know, you can kind of kind of read the tea leaves a little bit. Yeah, but the prevailing <laughs> winds would would push it across Russia. Yeah, and uh, so and also, of course, Russia controls the plant. We've been seeing this the entire time, where the news will talk about how. Um, there's shelling at the Zaporizhia nu nuclear power plant and how dangerous this is, but they're kind of evasive about who's who's <laughs> where, shelling where, it. Where them shells are coming from, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but since Russia actually controls the plant, yeah. the shells are coming from the Ukrainian military, right. not the Russian military. Um, and then, But uh, we don't want to talk about that because we're the one buying those shells. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. They are American-made. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then... Uh, Zelensky recently said that uh, that they had um, intelligence that Russia was planning to destroy the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as kind of a dirty bomb, yeah, and so forth. And this just this is the kind of thing that really does terrify me, yeah. um, because this seems like a setup to uh, a Ukrainian attack on the power plant that they then blame on Russia because they've laid the seeds that Russia was going to do this yep. um, to draw NATO into the war on their side because there's nothing that Zelensky wants more than that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's painfully obvious <laughs> if you listen to this guy. Like, that's, that's what his angle is. Yeah. And then, so then you've got Lindsey Graham who was out there handing out crackers and stuff at the in Ukraine before the coup in 2014 and you know yeah was he actually there mccain was there mccain was there i don't I remember thought, if graham though, was... graham's been back there though um it may have been more recently like i rem i had a clip we may have even played it on this podcast uh of him um saying that we you know that talking to the ukrainians and telling them that this is the the year for aggression that they need to beat back the russians and you know, that we'll support them and so forth. That's actually, that probably is more recently. That was probably yeah. like 2019 or something. Yeah. 2020. Um, I don't remember exactly though. But yeah, he's definitely a part of this. Like he's oh, been a part of this question, ever since. Yeah. And he's like one of the worst warmongers out there. He's, um, he's the one, man. So they're just, they're just like planting the seeds to create this excuse to actually get involved militarily directly in the war. And so everybody be aware of that beforehand. Tell everybody you know. Yeah, that, like, right. To, to have some skepticism if this power plant gets attacked. Yeah, yeah. Or destroyed or damaged or whatever in any way. Yeah. So. Yeah. False flag is definitely on the horizon in that power plant. It, and it has been for a while. I mean, that, <clears throat> that power plant has been a point of contention since the war started. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. Like, I just take that for what it's worth. I'd like to see them just shut it down. Although, I mean, I think they've kept it running so that it's continuing to supply power to Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Russians, the reason they took it and have held it is because they want it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they want access to that power, and um, the, particularly depending on what 
parts of Ukraine end up being carved out when all of this is done. Mm-hmm. Um, Russia definitely has, has made a play to have that. Um, they definitely saw it as a something that they needed to ensure that the Ukrainians couldn't turn off. Yeah. Because it does supply power to a bunch of the Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine. Yeah. The ethnic Russian areas of Ukraine, so. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, in other weird foreign policy news, yeah. Matt Gates um, made a, proposed an amendment to some bill that is in committee um, to give Biden, or the Biden administration, I guess, to give Biden permission to unilaterally uh, make a decision to bomb Chinese assets in Cuba. Oh, really? Yeah. See, this I haven't heard mm-hmm. about. Like, I've I've missed this, apparently. So, um, Cuba... Well, all right, so uh, just a few months ago... Was it... I don't remember. One of the... One of the big three papers in the in the U.S., New York Times, Washington Post, or uh, Wall Street Journal. I don't remember which. I think it was the Wall Street Journal, but I could be wrong. Um, put out an article about how the Chinese had a listening station in Cuba. and um, <coughs> But it's like that came out right before the rescheduled trip for Blinken to go to China. Oh, yeah. And that was postponed over the balloon. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is the reschedule. Okay. And then this story came out right before he was supposed to go on the reschedule Try again. trip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is one of those things that the U.S. uses to avoid uh, diplomacy when they don't want to do it. Yeah. You know, make up some story about how, you know, of some offense that the target nation has committed, so we don't want to talk to them now because we can't talk to them after they've done this to us. What it, you know, We don't want to negotiate with terrorists. In the same way that the stupid weather balloon thing, yeah, you know, became the excuse not to go in the first place. Yeah. So um, Blinken did end up going. Then, of course, Biden screwed that up afterwards. And then actually, oh, speaking of, we talked about last week... Uh, Biden calling she a dictator yeah. uh, after the Blinken trip. Well, then, like, Blinken doubled down with him. Really? Yeah, he's <laughs> like, he just supported what the president had to say after that. And I was like, oh, my God, we're just, yeah. you know, we're not getting anywhere. <laughs> nope. um, but this one's really interesting. And and Gates made some comments about it. It's like, you know, all, all my hawk friends on the committee that think I'm a dove, well, here you go. <laughs> oh, come on, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that's just oh so he's just you know i don't know keeping up appearances or whatever trying to fight against a yeah. an appearance uh, or a, a stereotype of him or i don't know um but of course china is nuclear armed also oh yeah yeah and and becoming closer and closer tied with russia yeah like i said that earlier yeah. like like that's my biggest of my worries, like mm-hmm. that's the biggest worry that I have that has started kind of happening in the past year or so mm-hmm. is that, that, you know, Russia and China are just becoming closer and closer. Yeah. Well, the good news is that even the two of them together spend uh, like less than 20% of what we spend on military. Yeah. But once the bombs start <laughs> dropping, man, no, it, it doesn't matter. It that's doesn't matter. Exactly like, the thing. I, you know, yeah. China again is a, has thermonuclear weapons. Yep. Um, they have like three or 400 of them. Yep. Even if we had some amazing uh, defensive system that would stop 99% of them. It only takes a handful. Which three or four cities are you willing to give up? Exactly. exactly. To keep them from listening to stuff that they can probably listen to with satellites on low Earth orbit and so forth anyway. Yeah. Uh, from Cuba. Exactly. And, of course, bombing Cuba, bombing Chinese assets in Cuba starts a war with two nations. <laughs> Yeah, right. China and Cuba. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't yeah. know. It's just, it amazes me how cavalier they are about all of this. Yeah. I don't know, man. Like, this is just, maybe it's just my ignorance. I've never, it's always irritated me that we're not more friendly with Cuba. 
Yeah. They're right there. Well, it was one of the best things Obama did was like, oh, yeah. You know, break down the trade barriers. Exactly. Mm-hmm. At least there was, yeah, because I remember when all of that was going on too, because mm-hmm. like the people on the right were giving him such a hard time about it. I was like, man, they're our neighbor. Yeah. Like, there's no reason. They're like less than 100 miles from us. Yeah. Why can't we not have <laughs> peace with these people? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. let's just, let's just do it. Like, yeah. Well, that's all I have to say on that. Um, if you want to transition away from foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, I did get a comment on our last podcast um, saying, uh, can not can we try and stop school shootings before we get rid of nucle- nuclear, nuclear weapons? weapons? Yeah. And I was like, well, I kind of have an answer for, <laughs> for the <laughs> nuclear weapons thing. I don't yeah. know that I have an answer for the school shootings, but... Like, I have some thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a proposal that I think would reduce the frequency specifically of school shootings. Okay. Um, which we've talked about on the podcast before, which is just to allow um, staff, a- adult staff at schools to conceal carry. Yeah. If they meet whatever requirements are, there are in their state to do so. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that that would reduce the frequency of school shootings because shootings of all kinds end up happening at places that are gun free -free zones. zones. Yeah. I'm anti gun free zone, like period. Yeah. Like that's, I just, I don't think that there's anywhere that needs to be a gun free zone. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's just my personal opinion. And, and I'm with you as far as with the concealed carry in the schools. Um, and I've went back and forth with a lot of my gun loving friends Mm -hmm. over just this because they're like, Oh no, you shouldn't have to conceal blah, blah, blah. I'm like, look, like if you want to open carry when you're walking down the street or going to the grocery store, I'm good with it. Mm-hmm. When we're talking about in the school, particularly in the school, and I would say in the bank as well, yeah, I think conceal is the, is should should be mandated, and it should be up to the establishment when it comes to banks how they want to do it. I'm mm-hmm. a libertarian, like I'm all about like yeah, businesses making decisions for themselves. Well, just in general, I would say actually, like businesses should be able to say no open carry and. In yeah. my yeah. facility. Yeah, but or I don't think that businesses should be able to go as far as no carry. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, if you want to put up no open carry signs, like, I support that, like, mm-hmm. a, for businesses and things like that. But yeah. I, I think that I, I just don't feel like, I, to me, you're creating a dangerous situation by making an area a, a no carry at all. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the, the kind of joke that I always make about this is that, um, at my uh, water utility uh, office, yeah, they have for, a sign up that says, "For your safety and ours, um, please no uh, no weapons inside no weapons the building." No weapons allowed. Yeah, and I always think that that's just hilarious because it's not like somebody who came there with a gun intending to do them harm is, is going to abide by the yeah, sign. Is going to say, "Oh no, no gun. okay, well let me go back to my truck and get my crowbar or yeah, whatever." Exactly. So. It just um, it just prevents law abiding people from being able to defend themselves. Yeah. And you know, for those that are like, why do you even need a gun in the first place? Like, you don't you don't need a gun. There's police and so forth. What well, we've covered many times, police have no responsibility to protect you. No, absolutely none whatsoever. Not. Um, I mean, I would say, look at was it ah? I don't even remember which one was it Uvalde or what? Which? Oh yeah, Uvalde was the more yeah. recent one where they just sat outside yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the old joke used to be, uh, I'll stop carrying a gun when I can carry a cop. But it turns out that even if you carry the cop, the cop doesn't have to help you. Yeah, that's not going to help you as much as you think. <laughs> so, um, to me, the reason to carry a gun is to defend myself, the people that I care about, and anybody else who can't. Yeah, That's absolutely. the whole point of carrying a gun. Yeah. But getting off track a little bit... Um, so well, that's that's my answer for school shootings, though. Well, and the armed society is a polite society, mm-hmm. and that's I mean I know that's an old like you know gun gra- our gun enthusiast saying, mm-hmm. but there's a lot to that. Like yeah. there's a lot that goes into like the reason that I believe that that's so true. Yeah, there's a know? whole new calculus when you're thinking about going in and shooting up a place when you might get shot back at. Yeah, exactly, and especially when you're. It, and that's the reason I like concealed in the schools mm-hmm. because like you don't know, even the students don't know which teachers are packing and which ones aren't. Yeah. Um, 
And it's a voluntary thing. And that's mm-hmm. the other thing, because the other big pushback that I've always heard about this this line of thinking that we're using is, well, you know, I don't want to mandate teachers carry and that kind of thing. And that's the glory of this. You're not. You just the te- There will be teachers who want to carry, and you just let them do so. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, as for the bigger problem, yeah. This is where there's a there's a deeper problem here. Oh, absolutely. And I there's some kind of sociocultural issue that I haven't I haven't been able to identify. Still still collating data as they say. <laughs> okay. Um but I mean I have some ideas, but there has been a, there really has been a rise in now while violence as a whole is down Random violence is up yeah. in the last quarter century, roughly. Yeah. Um, this kind of thing didn't really happen when I was a kid. Yeah. The the school shooting. Now, part of it may be that there were guns in schools when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, you could walk out in the parking there lot was... at my school, and there were dozens and dozens of guns yeah, they hanging were all... in the back of trucks. <laughs> exactly. Because people went hunting before they came to school. Yeah. And yeah. um and after Christmas you'd have people bring them inside. They would like show their new gun that they'd gotten for Christmas and so forth, keep them in the locker for the day and that kind of thing. Yeah. It, so it, I, you know, I don't <laughs> I'm not going to say necessarily that that's the safest way <laughs> to well, to handle things, but um but there we was didn't never have, a we didn't have these problems then though. Yeah. I mean the bottom line my mom line, was uh, teaching at an even more rural school yeah. than where I went. I mean like, you know, yeah. My high school was was for this area, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um fairly uh, urban's not the word, but you know, yeah. like not not real not really rural. Yeah. Um my mom taught at a much more rural school and they had there were plenty of guns in the parking lot in that school and every single kid walking around that school probably had a knife in their pocket. Oh yeah. yeah. And that's probably mostly true for our school too, but yeah. um but definitely out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they weren't supposed to have weapons at some point, but they, yeah. you know, they still carried knives. And before then there were all those guns in the parking lot. Um, I was talking to my mom about this last week and, uh, she, actually the, the same day that we recorded the podcast, like at, we went to lunch that day. So we'd been talking about school shootings. And then after the podcast, I got this <laughs> message about, you know, school. Sh- anyway, coincidence. Yeah, of course. There are no coincidences. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but she said they only had one shooting in the entire time that she was there, and it was actually a suicide. And I it was a kid that, that had some kind of brain tumor or something. I remember that. I was I was in school when that happened. That yeah. was a big deal. It was a yeah. big deal. Like I remember yeah. that. Like that was when I, I hadn't thought about it till you had said that. But I was mm-hmm. like, that was, God, that was hot. that was huge. Yeah. So I mean, it was a shooting, but it was a suicide from somebody that had like. It was like a terminal ear. problem. Ill, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then it was like right after I finished high school that Columbine happened, I guess. So I was that was my senior year. Maybe it was my junior year. I don't I exactly. Think it was your junior it year. may have been my junior year. Um, I was in school when Columbine happened. Yeah, that's the first thing like that that I can remember. Me too. Um, but well, it, it's, because it, it was such a big deal at the time, because oh, nothing yeah. like that had ever happened. Yeah. Well, and it, it's not just the school shootings, though. There's, like, a lot of random shootings. Yeah. Um, where is it, it, you know, while there were certainly shootings before the last quarter century, yeah. they were directed. Like, they were focused on, there was a yeah. there was a target. Yeah. Um, whereas there's a lot more shootings now where there's not really a target. It's just... I'm going to go kill a bunch of people. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so where does that come from? And I'm not really sure. I think that there's, I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that can be tied back to like problems that we have in our culture that can be tied back to, um, how people are being taught now. Now, part of it may just be that, you know, like kind of, um, hedonistic. No, that's not really the word that I want to use. Um, I don't know. I can't help you here. <laughs> I, I know. I, I, uh, just that there's a lot. People have a lot. Yeah. Well, now. the stress is real. In the- um, well, no, I, I just mean in like, in, in terms of actually like wealth. 
Like, oh, there's okay. a lot of wealth. Yeah. Um, out there. I mean, most of this, most of this kind of thing that we're talking about, this is not like low class. Oh, great. Kids. Yeah. This agreed. is a bunch of middle class and, and, uh, you know, upper yeah, middle class well kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's connected to that. I think more than anything though, it's connected to, um, just the way kids are taught now. That there's not any real truth. There's nothing that they can, there's nothing solid. There's no solid foundation for them to build their worldview on because yeah. they're told over and over that, that everything's malleable, that, yeah that truth is personal, not, there's not an objective truth that the, you know, you live your truth. Yeah. Like that there isn't something out there that exists outside of their own heads. That's <laughs> real, Yeah. you know? And, um, and I think like some of this, uh, like the genders aren't defined that, you know, gender doesn't exist. There's, there's not two genders. There's however many, instead of it being, um, you know, there's an infinite number of expressions of, of either the genders. Like, why can't yeah. that be a thing? Yeah. Like the gender is real. There are two genders, but there's an infinite number of ways that you can be a girl or be a boy. Yeah. Like, um, and, uh, I, I don't know. I talked about this at my brother's wedding when I, in my best man speech, I talked about the, that yeah. we define our world by binaries. Yeah. You know, there's no light without dark. You know, there's no love without hate. There's no day without night. Like this is how we define our, our, our world. And, and that's like a really solid foundation to build on. And you can start, you can start learning that there's a lot of gray area as you get older. But when you're, when you're young, you need something solid like that to build yeah. your worldview around. You need the yin and the yang. Yeah. Um, you need, you need something that's not malleable or it doesn't seem malleable, at least from the beginning. Yeah. And I think that we start teaching and you kids fill like the gray a, in as you go. Yeah. I think we start teaching kids a, a nihilistic point of view, like way too early, yeah. um, where there isn't anything objective or solid for them to build their worldview around. And, and that's like an uncomfortable situation. If you've never had something, you know, some place to hang your hat, some something to really anchor your, yourself on. Yeah, I, I think that it has something to do with that. I don't know. I mean, this is just you a have guess. to believe in something before you believe in nothing. Yeah, now you stole my line. <laughs> <laughs> so my cousin it's, thought that was great when I said that before. It I, just so like, fit. Like it just sounds like sheer that's... profundity. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, you have to believe in something before you can believe in nothing. Yeah, it's true though. Uh, um, and otherwise, you, it, it's just. I don't know. It's just an unstable place to start building your mind. And yeah. when your mind's in an unstable place, yeah, yeah, what happens next? Well, I, so that's just my thoughts on this. I mean, like, I don't know. It's I not like I have any research to back this up or anything. I don't, it's just, I don't have it's just any, my impression of things. I don't have any other than the answer that I feel like we gave at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, my only other thought is, as far as like reasoning goes, is I don't think you can just write big pharma off is not part of this. Oh yeah. Like uh use of SSRIs and stuff yes. like that. Like um, I just, I mean, you've got to believe that it's some level that like that's, that's gotta at least be a contributing factor. I have it. actually like a real serious question to the doc, um, uh, about SSRIs after this, uh, book, um, the doc gave me to read that I finished the two days ago, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I haven't gotten the chance. To, yet, to get so. some get some closure on that, yeah, yeah, and it wasn't actually directly related to to this kind of issue. It's just like some question that I have, um, yeah. because the book was saying that it um, that serotonin can be neurotoxic at certain levels, and if you're actually like preventing the serotonin from being cleared from the system, yeah, well, are mean, you potentially doing damage over time? I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. It'd be interesting to get somebody with a professional opinion. Yeah, the, the doc will have a better answer yeah. for that. Yeah. Than, you know, I'm I'm just yeah. My <laughs> mind's running wild. Yeah, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're just trying to put all these pieces together. Right? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there. To me, at least, it seems like there's got to be mm -hmm. there's some kind of correlation between when we started prescribing these type of drugs to kids and and teenagers. And when this phenomenon started happening, 
Because, I mean, I was in school during Columbine, you know, mm-hmm. and I mean, it, but prior to that, like, I don't remember anything like that ever happening. Well, and here's something And I else. remember people being prescribed these type of things when I yeah. was in school. Well, and I don't, I, it hasn't been well covered, but I, I think that in almost all of these cases, these kids have been on SSRIs or, or some form of. Yeah, no, uh, it hasn't been it hasn't been covered at all, as far as I can see. But the I mean, from what you can glean from you know other sources, that seems to be the case. Is yeah. that? But it makes sense because so many kids are on these things. That's true. Like I mean, just I mean, just the odds of them. And yet, I can't even find a psychiatrist around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in Lower <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> yeah, I uh, th- another thing that I have that I've considered here is that you're just giving them a very, you know, um, glum outlook Yeah. that, you know, you bring these kids up telling them that we're destroying the world and there's not going to be a world to live on in 15 years and that you'll never be able to make a living because, uh, there won't be any jobs or their money won't be worth anything or whatever. Yeah. You know, this long, this litany of potential existential problems that you will face as you get older and, and, and that you may not even be able to get by. Like you're giving them a very hopeless world to inhabit. And, you know, hopelessness leads to some interesting behaviors. Yeah. Some dark places. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Those are just like some of the things that are in my head about what, what may the, be the cause of this, but I do think that the you know the cause is some kind of sociocultural issue. Yeah, it's something that we have done in our culture that has created a mindset that that. Well, and I can tell you what has to this kind of random violence. I can tell you what hasn't helped, and this is something I remember early in the podcast you spoke on, mm-hmm. and it's it's the perpetual war. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I, as soon as you said that, I was thinking, oh yeah, well, there's the also the issue of you can't maintain a moral society in a, in a constant state of war. It's true. Like I mean, it. I, I when you initially said that on the podcast early on, like I was more skeptical of it. But as mm-hmm. time has went along and as I've watched more, I'm like, dude, there's something to that. Yeah. Like I mean, it's you don't you wouldn't think like just looking at it that mm-hmm. that would have such an effect, but it just does. It just devalues life. It it, it does. And it just in a it's it's a crazy phenomenon. It also creates the this constant state where there's this like good guys and bad guys. There's an enemy. There's always an enemy. Yeah. Um us versus them all the time. And and it um and in wars generally the other side is dehumanized in a way that that makes it easier to I mean, the to it's, just not it's to, to not value life. Yeah, it's purposeful to allow people to commit violence against these kind of non people. Yeah, um, without the same kind of moral impact, like the the moral damage mm. um, that you should hopefully otherwise feel, unless you're a psychopath. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I don't know, some things to think on. If you guys have thoughts, like I would love to. I would love to hear because yeah. I'm, I'm like really interested in sussing this out. Yeah. And there's uh there's a whole lot of variables. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a cultural thing that, that our society has taken on in the last 20 some odd years. Yeah. Um, it's, there's, there's no easy answers. Like, I mean, we proposed some stuff at the beginning that I do think would help. Those aren't solutions. I mean, right. but, but I mean, I do think they would at least help. Like, I mean, I, yeah, mitigate some of the damage. Yeah. I mean, but that's, I mean, that's what you're talking about. You're not, mm-hmm. no, nothing we've proposed here is going to fix anything. Yeah. But I, I truly believe that the real damage is psychological. Yeah. That that's where the root is. Yeah. And that's where, that's what needs to be hashed out. And mm-hmm. people probably smarter than me and you need to fi- be the ones to figure it out. I just wish they would. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, direct this at them and maybe they'll listen to what we had to say and say, hmm. Yeah, right. That's a testable idea. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can't design the experiment. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, if you, those of you listening, if you have thoughts, agree, disagree, have other ideas, yeah. man, I, I'm really like genuinely interested. Absolutely. So uh, you can always contact me at michael at the liberty mic.com. 
Um, and then also, you know, you can reply on Facebook comments on Facebook or YouTube or Podbean, yeah. um, which is all places that you can find us. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, um, subscribe, leave comments, like, and share, tell your friends, all those things help us out a lot. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, and we just like the engagement. And then of course you can email me at Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. The Liberty Mike.com is the website. Uh, I've been working on some articles, so I'll probably have some stuff out pretty soon. I also oh, set up a new exciting. page yeah. um, where I transferred all the articles that have been, that we put out so far uh, into their own page. I mean, they're in the, the like post feed if you go all the way back because it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, this is the last article that I wrote. So we need to get the work that on I that. Put out there. I actually finished one. I just need to add links and stuff. Yeah. Um, but the the last real article that I wrote was about the Soleimani assassination. That was a long time that ago. That was a while back now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whew, that was a while back. Yeah. Beginning of 2021. Or like 2020. That. 2020, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I've been lazy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, those years just slip right by, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I say I've been lazy, but if you see my notebooks for this podcast, you would think, yeah, good you, Lord. You're doing something, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, so there is a new page on the website that's just the articles. So it's the the ones that I just wrote as a blog are there and the ones that um, were published other places like the Libertarian Institute and Anti-War and so forth. Yeah. Um, they're there with links. I mean, they're... Yeah, they're linked on the articles page. So um, check that out too if you're interested in some of that old stuff. Uh, there's stuff about Venezuela. That, I mean, there's and yeah. there's stuff that's still re relevant about um, the uh, military industrial complex, like the contractors and how much money they're making and how much they spend on lobbying and so forth. The numbers have changed, but this point but, hasn't. But yeah, exactly. Um, it's still going on. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some just kind of musings there as well. And I, I really should take more advantage of like putting stuff up there, but yeah. it has to be about something specific really for, for this. I, I've been yeah. looking at other outlets for maybe just writing like random things. Yeah. Um, cause I, I need to get back into the habit. It's a habit. Yeah. I like writing. Yeah. Um, I, you just gotta, you just gotta do it like every day. Yeah. And I'm bad about that. <laughs> like, routine takes yeah. me a while. So anyway, um, but we'll uh, we're planning to be back here next week, and um, you know do all that stuff to help support the podcast. In the meantime, again, we appreciate it, and we'll uh, we'll see you next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. <laughs>